Thank you. So the first question I have is who built the table saw sled? I'll give you five bucks for it. That's, that's pretty impressive. Thank you. Um, so just a little bit about me. Uh, 2005, I took a job in Des Moines, Iowa as an editor for Woodsmith and Shop Notes magazine and uh, spent 10 years there. And then I moved to Clearwater and now I'm writing for Wood Magazine. Uh, you, how many receive Wood Magazine? Okay, the... the used to, but not anymore. <laughs> the Your Shop articles and all the shop tips are what I, I put together for that magazine, uh, in addition to some technique articles. Um, so, uh, and then uh, just recently I moved my shop to uh, just behind the airport. I'm sharing some warehouse space with Coincidentally, the uh, U.S. distributor for uh, the books. Uh, the publisher is out of the U.K., GMC Publications. Um, I got to know the gentleman here. We became fast friends, and, and so I've been writing books for them for th three years now. Um, got a couple, couple of books in, uh, in the hopper we're working on, and uh, so anyway, I stay busy. Um, so the books are 20 bucks a piece, uh, a, a PayPal or uh, cash. Uh, if you want me to sign them, I, I'm happy to do so, so that you know someday you could sell them on eBay for a dollar. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's enough of that. So um, I sent out that email survey, and Raul was kind enough to uh, compile it for me. And the bottom line that I've discovered is we all struggle with sharpening, don't we? Yes. Um, and, and quite frankly, I did too when I started. And I think part of it is the fear that we're going to screw up a tool. Yeah. And you know what? You may just screw up a tool, but in the process, you've learned something. And so tonight, I just kind of want to talk about the basics of sharpening. I can't get to all of the questions, two pages worth of questions uh, you had, but uh, hopefully we'll go through the process. Of, now, as I was talking to somebody earlier, you know, you ask 100 woodworkers how they sharpen and you'll get 100 different answers. I'm here to show you how I sharpen and whether or not that applies to you or not, you know, that's, that's your decision. But um, anyway, we'll get going on that. So, um, We'll save some room at the end for questions, but at any time during the presentation, you got a question, just pop up your hand, and if I don't see you, uh, holler. All right. So, what in your mind is the definition of sharpness? What is sharp? Tell me. The ability to cut easily. The ability to cut easily, okay? That's it. Correct answer. He wins the prize. So I, I, I made a little prop here uh, this afternoon. A sharp edge is the intersection of one polished edge and another polished edge coming together at a line. Now, as you use a tool, what happens to that line? It starts to round over becomes dull. Now it's not sharp. Well, if it gets jagged, then you've got another issue. <laughs> he is a problem. <laughs> um, so, you know, when we talk about sharpness, we talk about a bevel, and we talk about the back. And when I say back, I mean the opposite side of the bevel. All right? And the angle that those two intersect is called the bevel angle. Okay, and there are some common bevel angles for woodworking tools that you can pretty much rely on. And so when you sharpen, your goal is to get that nice, sharp edge. Now, 
There is a way to cheat, if you, if you want to call it cheating. It's not really cheating, but and that is to put a what we call a micro bevel on the end of the main bevel. What's a micro bevel? Anybody tell me what a micro bevel is? It's a secondary, secondary uh, bevel. It's only one or two or at the most three degrees steeper than the main bevel. And why do we do that? It's easier. It's easier. That's right. We're lazy. It's easier to remove that small amount of material to get to that sharp edge than it is to try to polish the whole bevel to get back to your sharp edge. So uh, that's, that's what we call a micro bevel. I'm gonna go ahead and pass this around. Now, when we talk about, th this represents most Western style chisels and plain irons. When we get to talking about Japanese tools, how many own Japanese tools? Few. Okay, Japanese tools are usually hand forged and they purposely have a hollow formed on the back side so that when you flatten the back, you only have to flatten the edges and the bevel. A whole lot easier to do than a traditional plain iron. Same thing with the Japanese chisels. They're usually, the better ones are hand forged they also have a hollow on the back. So I, I kind of drew a dotted line on the back of this so you could see what that looks like. And you, you're welcome to come up later and uh, take a look. So the goal is two intersecting edges to uh, create what we call a sharp edge. Two intersecting planes to create a sharp edge. Now, how do we do that? What's we have to have some way of removing the metal to create that intersection point, right? And what do we use to do that? An abrasive. Okay, what, does it matter what abrasive it is? Hmm, not really. I could use sandpaper. I could use an oil stone, sometimes called a wet stone. I can use a water stone. I can use a ceramic water stone. I can use a Tormac with a, a wet wheel grinder. I could use uh, a diamond stone. Doesn't really matter. It's an abrasive. We're removing metal to form that sharp edge. Now, when I first got into woodworking, uh, oh, I want to introduce my lovely bride over here. Uh, what's your name? Uh, Cheryl. <laughs> That's Cheryl. Uh, she's the bookmonger tonight. Uh, and anyway, when we were first married, my first uh, shop was in the basement of our first home and money was tight. And so when I was trying to learn how to sharpen tools, I used wet dry sandpaper. And I used that for probably 10 or 15 years. Did you have it on a piece of glass? Yes. Now, that brings me to the next point. Any abrasive that you use, whether it's sandpaper, water stones, diet, whatever it is, has to be dead flat. What if it's not flat? What if you use, what if you use a water stone? You know, as you use a water stone, it's going to start to hollow out in the center. Does that matter? Yeah. Why? It's not flat. Because I'm not forming a straight edge anymore, right? So I have to have a flat surface. So for sandpaper, I, I went to, I think it was Home Depot, and I bought a 12 inch floor tile, granite, and I still have it in my shop. And so I'd set that on my bench, put my sandpaper down, and go to work. Now, do you use it wet or dry? Yes. yes. <laughs> I found that using wet dry sandpaper for me works better when it's dry because as soon as you put water on it, it wants to buckle. Unless you put spray adhesive on it to really tack it down to your granite or glass or whatever it is you're using, um, it's gonna buckle. So, uh, for example, if this is my sandpaper and I'm trying to sharpen an edge, 
and that paper, paper starts to buckle ahead of that edge, what happens? It, it, it can tear the sandpaper, but worse than that, it, rolls the edge. It, it rounds over the edge. Microscopically, maybe, but it forms a rounded edge, which is not what you want. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's not what you want for a sharp edge. So you have to make sure if you're using sandpaper that it stays flat, and uh, I, I use it uh, dry. Now, uh, wet dry sandpaper at that time, uh, I could get at Home Depot up through 2000 grit. And that seemed to do fine for me. Uh, so I'd start it, you know, what, uh, if it was a really rough edge I needed to bring back to shape, I'd start at like 220 and then work through, I'd, I'd buy five sheets of every grit. So I'd have some on hand and I just work my way up through all the grits and do my final polishing at 2000 on a 2000 grit piece of sandpaper. Okay, so whatever it is you're using has to be flat. Now, let's talk about stones. Water stones are very popular, <clears throat> they're relatively inexpensive. However, uh, like most anything else, you get what you pay for. Uh, you can buy water stones relatively inexpensively off of Amazon and quickly find out that they wear very quickly and they don't stay flat. You have to spend a lot of time flattening them. Um, so it, it pays to do your research if, you, if you're you know, online and on Facebook or the internet, do, do your research, ask around. There are a ton of Facebook groups. There's a Florida Woodworkers Group actually on Facebook. Um, and there are tons of other woodworking groups, you know, where you can go up and ask questions. And of course you'll get all this, you know, snarky comments back, but every once in a while you'll get a useful answer. And um, Now, when I was writing the sharpening book, one of the companies that I developed a relationship with, and I'm not, I don't get anything out of this, uh, uh, but they, they know what they're doing. They have a wide variety, the widest variety of sharpening products I've ever seen. And that's sharpeningsupplies.com. And I think they're out of Wisconsin. Um, you call up there or email them, you'll get the right answer. Tell them what you're looking for, and they'll make recommendations on products, and those guys know what they're talking about. So a lot of the products I have here are from them, but that doesn't mean you know you couldn't find something similar elsewhere. Water stones are co commonly available dual-sided. So you get two different grits on the same stone, which saves some money. However, you have less stone to work with, but how long is it gonna take you to wear through that much material? A uh, long time. Ceramic water stones, what did I do with it? Chucky ate it. Oh, there it is, right on the end. Ceramic water stones are most, most water stones and most ceramic water stones are man-made. And a ceramic water stone actually has zirconium in it that's fired in an oven to make a hard, long-wearing surface. And you can get a ceramic water stone up to like 15,000, 16,000 grit, maybe even higher. Um, but these, this, is, this happens to be a Shapton. Uh, they're pricey, but they don't require as much flattening or flattening as often. And they're long wearing and they put a nice polish on the edge. So you could spend as much money as you want on sharpening supplies. So like when I started out, you know, I said I was using sandpaper and then I went to something like this. Uh, Brockler has this nice little kit. It's got a 600 or I'm sorry, 800 to 4,000 dual sided water stone. And it's got an 8,000, uh, or I'm sorry, 6,000 grit water stone for final polish. 
and I forget what this cost, but it was, it was really reasonable. Now, it's not the high end, but if you're just looking to get into water zones, this, this, is, a, this is a decent option. All right, so um, what about grinders? Somebody mentioned they have a Tormek. Um, who uses a high-speed grinder to sharpen their tools? Please don't raise a hand. All right. My axe. I use one with paper wheels. Okay. Uh, high-speed grinders uh, that you'd find on your dad's or your grandpa's workbench for grinding metal, uh, you know, as in welding metal and angle iron and stuff like that is not a good match for a finely honed tool. You can purchase uh, a low speed grinder which runs in I think around 1700 RPM. Versus 3500 Yeah, 3500 is a high speed. Uh, I would not use a high speed grinder on a tool. You can buy what they call friable, F-R-I-A-B-L-E, grinding wheels that actually break off as they grind so they don't heat up as much. Uh, but still, your best bet is to use a low-speed grinder or a wet grinder like a Tormac. Randy, I, I don't have them, but the high-speed grinders, are they good just for doing the hollow the, the chisels? I would I say... I recommend that either. I, I don't because it's too easy to overheat the blade and then you ruin the temper. And now you've got a piece of steel that's not worth anything. Yeah, if it, if it turns blue, you're done. There's nothing you can do to recover. Uh, so a low speed grinder, uh, I hadn't planned on talking about a hollow grind, but do we know what that is? Everybody know what a hollow grind is? It's where you use a wheel to actually form the main bevel, but because of the diameter of the wheel, you've got a kind of a hollow along the parallel to the cutting edge, which can be good because there's less material to remove when you're honing the bevel, right? It's only gonna to touch at the toe and the heel of the bevel. So hollow grind could be a good thing. Yes. Uh, the question came up in one of the responses to the survey about turning tools. I am not a turner. I have taken a turning class and I have sharpened turning tools, but you need to, to talk to somebody that actually does it you know, for a living or does it every day uh, because turning tools are a unique beast. Uh, they, you know, the way you sharpen them has no bearing on chisels and plain irons and tools like that. Um, so a low speed grinder uh, works and it helps to have some sort of guide so that as you're using the wheel, you keep that edge pair, uh, square to the wheel so that you've got a straight edge all the way across and it's square to the sides of the blade. So that's about all I will say about that. Now, I, well, not really. So even if you use a grinder, and even if it's a Tormek, I would still touch it up when I'm done and polish the bevel with a water stone or, or a fine abrasive. Because I don't think you can get a Tormek to put a high polish, unless you use a leather hone. I do understand they have leather hones. And the rubber paste has got small abrasive Right, parts. so. Yeah, you can it, polish it up pretty well. I can't afford a Tormac, so I'm not familiar with it. But if it, if it has a way to polish the edge, then that's that's fine. Uh, but if you use a normal grinding wheel, uh, always touch up the edge with a, a water stone or a fine abrasive. Any questions so far? How can you tell on the water stone you have two different abrasives on the same stone? How can you tell which is which? They label them. Oh, well, mine's not labeled, so. Well, in that case, you'd have to go digging for the instructions that came with it or go online to find the one that you bought and see if it tells you which side is which. Because, you know, sometimes they're confusing. You can usually look at it. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, unfortunately, they don't have a color standard. You know, if, if I knew that, you know, light brown was always 220, that'd be great, but that's not always the case. It depends on the manufacturer. So on this, they, they print the grits on the side. Now, what's cool about these, and these are from sharpening supplies, is I, I start at 220, and then I go up to 3,000, and then I go up to 6,000. And when I'm done with the 6,000, I can turn them over and go to, a, I'm sorry, go to 1,000, 8,000, and 10,000. So they're, they're designed to go in, in a progressive sequence. Why do we care what the grid is and what order we use them? You've got to uh, polish each scratch out. Correct. As you, uh, typically you're gonna start with a coarser grit and where you start depends on the condition of your cutting edge and that's a subjective thing. But if, you know, if you've got a, a chip out of the end of your chisel because you hit a nail or something, um, which, you know, you should never have a chisel near a nail, but that's another topic. Anyway, for whatever reason you got a chip or a nick out of your blade, uh, you'll need to start with probably the coarsest grit that you have and work your way up through to remove it. Now, that's another good application for a low speed grinder. If the nick is big enough, you're gonna spend all day on the stone trying to get rid of it. If you had a low speed grinder, you could you know, get it back past that nick and then start polishing the edge. Uh, on the Tormac machine, they have a grading stone that comes with it. And what happens is uh, when you're starting from scratch, like I said, if you had a nick, you take the coarse side of the grading stone and hold it on the wheel. And it loads the face of the wheel with 300 grit, which is pretty coarse. Oh, yeah. And you can grind that down pretty well. And when you're finished with that, you flip over the grading stone. And now it's a thousand grit. I have been known to use a belt sander, a stationary belt sander like that, uh, with like a 120 grit belt on it. You can get that hot and blue it too. Yes, you can get you can get that too hot, yes. So that you have to be real careful there. And you always want to have a can of water or something there to dip the blade in as you go. But that's that's a last resort. That's you know, I've I've rarely had to do that. <laughs> yeah. All right, so enough of that. Any questions before I go through the process I use to sharpen? Yes, sir. You haven't mentioned diamond stone, metal stone well, with diamond on Yeah, I did, but I didn't show you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, a diamond stone, everybody familiar with diamond stones? Piece of flat steel that's been machined flat, we hope, and is coated with uh, diamond grit. Uh, and there are a couple different methods they use to do that. Um, but these are long wearing. You don't have to flatten them, uh, but you pay for them. You know, for the better ones, you, you'll pay a pretty penny. However, like I said, they last a long time. It's an investment. So, and they, these come in a wide variety of grits. Um, st the stones I have started using once I graduated from sandpaper were these duo stones from DMT. They've got a, a different size grid on each side. Is that a diamond stone? Yes. They're perforated because that, as you know, when you sharpen, you're generating swarf. You're removing particles of metal. So those perforations help you know, keep the swarf away from the cutting edge on top. So these, I've used these for years. Um, these are great little, little uh, and they aren't that pricey. So that's, that's about all I'll say about diamond stones. All right, so my process for sharpening is to always, 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 whenever you buy a plain iron or a chisel, flatten the back. Number one step, first requirement for sharpness, flatten the back. You only have to do that once, ever. Once the back is flat, you never have to touch it again except to remove the burr, which I'm gonna talk about later. But once that back is polished, it's done. So, um, 
Never make the assumption if you purchase a used tool, uh, plain iron or, or plain that's been used or an antique or whatever, uh, or you find some chisels at a yard sale or something, never assume that they've been properly sharpened. So you always flatten the back. Now to do that, I've got this uh, chisel here that I've had for decades now. It's got a little rust on it. And one of the questions that came up was uh, cleaning up a tool or a plane. And suddenly I can't find what I'm looking for. Little green non-woven abrasive pad or a 3M pad. Scotch-Brite. Scotch we can't use trade names here. <laughs> uh, Scotch-Brite pad does a really, really nice job of removing the rust, any surface rust. Okay, so I'm just going to clean that up a little bit. This has got a little glue on the end because I used it to clean up some glue. So, um, you know, I would need to work on that. But for the purposes of illustration, I'm going to sharpen this chisel. And to do that, uh, we're going to start with polishing the back. Yes, sir. So, pardon the trade name because I'm not really sure. <laughs> I'm joking, by the way. Evapo rust type. Yes, there. yes. Those are okay? Yes, I've used Evapo rust. Um, it's great stuff. Just don't use it on the wood. Right. No, I don't, <laughs> don't, don't submerse it, in other words. Right. Okay, so this chisel has been sharpened before, so I'm going to start with a thousand grit stone. Now, if, how many have water stones? Okay. So when you purchase your stones, it should have come with a set of instructions that told you how to prep your stone for use. Some water stones like to be soaked for several minutes beforehand. Some water stones don't like to be soaked. They just need spritzed with water as you use them. I know the Shaptons. Don't put a Shapton in a tank of water. Just spray it with a spray bottle as you sharpen. So this one, I've, I've had soaking before, but we're just gonna make sure it's nice and soaked. So I've got the thousand grit side up, and I don't know if you guys can see this or not. You can see it on the overhead. Okay, oh, I almost forgot. Remember what I said about flatness? You know what? When I was writing the sharpening book, I told my wife, I said, you know what? I, I need to find something that I can put on my bench that keeps the water and stuff. Two dollars at uh, Salvation Army store. It's, it's a serving tray. It's, a, it's an old Ikea model, I found out. But it's, a, it's an old serving tray that I found at uh, Salvation Army or Goodwill or one of those places. So it was, you know. It's perfect for what I got. And speaking of which, I've got a router mat under it so it doesn't move. And then on top of that, I've got another router mat or a shelf liner. If you want to go the cheap route, it's the same stuff. Uh, shelf liner underneath the stones so as I'm using them, they don't move. Okay? So where was I? Flat. Flattening. So never assume that a water stone is flat. And I mean never. I've been guilty of sharpening a few tools, taking a few swipes on it, going back to doing some woodworking, need to touch up the blade, and forget to flatten the stone. To flatten a stone, you can use a coarse diamond stone, or you can purchase what's called a flattening stone. It's got a coarse abrasive. This one's two-sided, but usually they're one-sided. They've got channels in them to help get rid of the swarf. But all you do with those, you just get them wet, put it on top of the stone, and you're just watching the surface until it's all uniform. If you have trouble seeing that, you can take a pencil and mark it. And... Uh, go from there, but you have to make sure that your stones are flat. And it do, if you do it before you sharpen, it doesn't take very much. If you sharpen, you know, 20 chisels without flattening and then you come back 
a, a week later to flat, you know, sharpen a plain iron or something, then you've got some work to do. Flattening stones are great. It, nope, it never, never requires it. I don't ask me why, but I've never heard of having to flatten a flattening stone. So, all right. All right. So I've got my thousand grit stone. I place it so it's parallel with the front edge of my bench. I take my chisel and I hold it in my right hand like this. If you're left-handed, you're gonna do the opposite. Hold it just like this. Put maybe half inch to an inch of the blade, back of the blade on the edge of the stone. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. And then I just, I move my hand up so that I'm applying pressure down on that bevel, keeping that back absolutely flat on the stone. And then I'm just going to go back and forth along the edge of the stone, like so. One trick you can use is to blacken the back of your blade with a Sharpie. That'll give you an indication of where the high spots are. And I don't know if you guys can see this or not. Is that focused? Can you see, can you see a little hollow in there? Nope, this is, this is a Narex chisel made in Czechoslovakia. Uh, I've had these for years and years. Um, I had one chisel from them that was crowned on the back. In other words, if you look at the back of the blade like this, it had a hump in the middle. Those are almost impossible to fix because as you move the blade back and forth, it's actually rocking. It wants to rock and, and you never really get rid of the, so, you know, I had one occasion where I, you know, I eventually worked it out, but it, it took me a couple hours to figure out how to get rid of that hump. You didn't use it as a gouge? <laughs> no. <laughs> if you know a good machinist, it comes out. Now, so when I, I forgot to mention, I've, I've taught classes at the Florida School of Woodwork, uh, you know, uh, uh, basic hand tool joinery, and we spend a full day, a full day just sharpening tools because a sharp tool is a prerequisite for the rest of the class. Now, when you flatten the back, remember how I showed you how I was holding it? I've got this hand back here and I've got my left hand up on top of that to keep that pressure down. I had a student was holding his chisel back here and trying to do this. What happened? He raised the back of the handle and now he rounded over the back edge of his chisel and ruined it. So, the reason I keep my hand up front, right on that bevel, is to resist the temptation to lift up on the back of that, that chisel. Because once you form a round edge, now you've, moved, now you've moved the cutting edge in, and it's not referenced off the back anymore. And the back is a reference for all your joinery when you use a chisel. So you have to have that cutting edge parallel with the surface of the back. And as soon as you lift that blade and you start rounding over that edge, you actually move that cutting edge up a little bit. So you make a shorter chisel? That's what we would have to do, yes. You grind it, start over. All right, so that's, any questions on that? And I'm just talking about the last half inch or so. That's all you need to do. I've seen guys try to sharpen the whole length of the blade and they spend all day doing it. It's totally unnecessary. All you care about, remember what we said up front, all we care about is the intersection of two polished planes to form a sharp edge. It doesn't matter if that plane is only a half inch long, as long as it's polished clear up to that, that edge. Okay, now I'm going to, I would normally go through every grid of stone I have, uh, probably up through 8,000 8, anyway. 
I want to be able to see myself on the back of this chisel. I want it that polished. Why is that? The more polished it is, the smoother it, the, goes, through the smoother it goes through the wood because think about it on a microscopic level. As you polish something, you're removing, you're making smaller and smaller scratches. You know, and those scratches translate into a jagged cutting edge and you don't want that. Now, some people might say, well, you're being anal about that. Well, yes, I am because I know what a sharp chisel should do and how it should act. So I always, plain irons, uh, chisels, the backs always get polished. So any questions on polishing the back? So what about the bevel now? That's where everybody gets scared, right? Yeah. Polishing the back is relatively easy. Getting the bevel flat and smooth and polished is where we have trouble. Now, I polish by hand. And I polish by hand because it's a whole lot quicker for me to come up to a stone put an edge on my chisel than it is for me to fuss with a honing guide, trying to get the angle set right. You know, because by the time I do all that, I could have three chisels sharpened. However, if, you, if, that, if, if sharpening by hand makes you nervous, and based on the survey results, it does, uh, invest in a good honing guide. And when I say a good honing guide, I'm not talking about one of these. I hate these things. I hate those things. <laughs> I don't know how to use it. It's been in my drawer. Exactly. <laughs> no, these, these are what are called clamping style honing guides. The idea being that you clamp your blade in between the jaws. And based on where that is in relation to the cutting edge determines the angle of the bevel. You can buy from Veritas or Lee Valley an angle guide. It's got you know, 25, 35, 30, 20, 15 degree angles on it. And you could set it up. So I've got it set on 25. So you come in here like this, you figure out where that is, and then you move the honing guide down until it contacts that. That helps immensely. But what I don't like about these clamping style honing guides is that they don't clamp very well. They move. Your blade's gonna move. I don't care how tight you tighten it. I have never had success using one of these. Now, there are guys that swear by them. That's all they use. But for me, I would just as soon throw this in the garbage or sell it to somebody that doesn't know any different. <laughs> all right, so a step up from that again um, I'm a fan of Veritas tools, by the way. I'm, I'm not paid by them. I, you know, I just use their stuff and, and appreciate it. But this is one of their honing guides. It's got a nice big clamp at the top to clamp, to clamp your blade down, and you could use the guide the same way to establish where on, on the blade it needs to be for that bevel. It's a decent tool. What's nice about it is it has a cam on it. So once you get the main bevel polished, you can turn the cam and it offsets that wheel just enough to form a micro bevel. So you can go back and take four or five swipes on the stone. Now you've got a nice sharp micro bevel. Those are nice. If I need to establish a bevel on a tool because it's, you know, maybe I got a used one or it came from the factory a little off. Um, if I need to establish a bevel, I will use a honing guide, but I use one of these guys. It's made by Veritas. It's called the, uh, uh, what is it called? Mark II. Yeah, Mark II. Veritas Mark II honing, <clears throat> excuse me, honing guide. It looks like a complicated beast. 
And when you pull it out of the box, you're going, there's no way I'm going to figure out how to use this thing. But if you actually read the instructions, it's pretty simple. So this, this allows you to... Does that mean we have to be able to read? Yes, <laughs> yes. Or have somebody read it to you. So this, this gauge is nice because you set the bevel angle on, on the fence. You stick your blade through there, it's, and it forms a stop. So it stops the blade at the proper distance from the wheel to form that angle. And then it's got a really wide clamp, which is handy for plane irons, to, to it securely clamps down that blade so it's not going to move. So if I have to establish a bevel, um, I would use this to get it started um, and then maybe finish up by hand. Speaking of bevel angles, most chisels and plane irons are pretty close to 25 degrees. I've had some chisels come from the factory and maybe 27. Who cares? It's close to 25 degrees. Um, if you have a pairing chisel, Pairing chisels are longer so that you can pair the end grain and make fine shavings with it. Sometimes you'll find those at a shallower 20 degree angle. But plain irons um, and chisels, most bench chisels, are usually about 25 degrees. So that's a good starting point for you for a reference. All right. Um, just for grins and giggles, I'm going to go ahead and use this guide. How are we doing on time? We're good. Don't worry about it. It's good. Any questions while I'm setting this up? So I'm, I'm setting this in here. I should mention that there's a gauge on the top where you set the width of your blade. I think that's about a, yeah, it's a one inch. So I'm going to set my mark on one inch, and that centers the blade on the clamp. So I'm going to stick my chisel through there, and I'm going to shove it in until it stops on that, that stop. And I've got that stop set at 25 degrees. I don't know, you can't see that, but... Camera. Put it on the camera. Not yeah, the... He is. He is. That's, oh, this okay. is... That's so can you see that? Yep. Yeah. At the stop is set at 25 degrees? Yes. All right. So once I've got that set, I'm going to tighten that clamp down and I'm going to kind of put some pressure on it. Oops. I should point out too that there's a fence along here to help keep your blade square. So you want to make sure the side of your blade is up against that fence and the tip of the bevel is against the stop. I'm going to clamp it down. Now I can loosen my guide, slide that off, and I'm ready to go. Set it 25 degrees, it's square. This is pricey. I mean, what, 70 bucks or something like that? I don't know, somewhere around there. But this, it's worth it. It's worth every single penny, especially if you're like me and you really care about what kind of edge you get on your tools. Um, it's just so nice to be able to be able to rely on it to know that I'm going to get the angle I want. Did you say that's from Veracruz? <clears throat> yes. Uh, all right. So this this bevel has it's got some issues. So I would probably start with the coarsest grid I have up here, which is 220. So as you sharpen, you guys may not be able to see this that well. To use a honing guide, I put two fingers up on the blade, put pressure down on that bevel, and then you're just going to use as much of the stone as you can. Start working that bevel. Now you got to be careful that you don't go off the back edge and let your wheel drop off. So you just keep checking your progress. Do you push and pull? Yes. All my questions and answer that same question. I was yes. taught pull only. 
Why? Keep the hip chisel from digging into the stone. I have never had that happen, ever. Especially when using a honing guide. I thought it was pull only, but myself. <laughs> okay, if that what if you want to use pull only, that's fine. I'm just curious. But I I have never had an issue doing both. If you weren't careful and your angle was too high. Yeah. Dig in the stone, but with a or if side. or if you or if you you know accidentally lift up on it as you're pushing. What's that? Or if you're setting your angle. Right. So I can tell just by looking at the scratch marks, and here again, if you really want a good indication of, of uh, how you're doing, use a Sharpie to mark that bevel, and obviously the stone will take away the high spots. All right, so this chisel is in such bad shape, I'm actually only removing material from the heel of the bevel. Okay, so I've got some, you know, in reality I would have some work to do to get that bevel back to 25 degrees. But it's, it, I mean, already it's going pretty quick on a 220 grit stone. Well, three, oh, 220 you said, okay, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah, so, you know, I, I'm not going to do that whole thing now, but then, you know, once, <laughs> once the bevel, once you see the same scratch marks all the way across the bevel, then you go up to the next finer stone and you just keep working your way up. Any questions on, on that? I, I do have a question. So if you started with 220 and you worked your way all the way up, that angle is going to change by because you're removing amounts of steel from that tip. You're less than one tenth of one percent. <laughs> yeah, it's it's microscopic, and and I've actually I was I loved geometry when I was in high school, and I've had that same thought in my head, but you're talking microscopically, you know, it's not going to matter. Okay. Um, Maybe yeah. Not just taking off the high points. Right. So if you really have a bad chisel and you really had to get on it, then you would want to reset. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so any questions on honing guides? I mean, you've got the basic and then you've got the Cadillac version here. Does the Cadillac version also have that little adjustment to do a micro bevel? Yes, yes, okay. I meant to mention that. It's, yep. I know the other one, the middle one does, yep. but I didn't know. And, it's, and both of these actually have a couple, you know, depending on how steep you want that micro bevel, you know, they've got a couple different <coughs> settings for it. Um, real quick, I just want to mention, for those of you that have Japanese tools or are considering it, Really, the only way to sharpen a Japanese hand plane blade is by hand. Because they're hand forged, you can't be guaranteed that the edges are square. And most of them are wedged, so they're you know, thicker at the top than they are down here. But because they're so thick, you get a super wide bevel, which allows you to maintain registration on that stone by hand. So let's find my finest grit here. I've got 10,000 grit. There are some, I just wrote an article on Japanese planes actually. Um, and <clears throat> there are some that were traditional style Western, or used to, you know, these kind of planes. They switched over to Japanese planes and they won't go back. There's something about <clears throat> the steel, the metallurgy, that these blacksmiths in Japan use. I swear I have never seen sharper edges than what I could get on a Japanese tool. So these, these Japanese planes, they cut on the full stroke? Yes, right? yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, I wrote the article from the aspect of, hey, I've never owned one. I'm thinking about getting one, so what do I need to know? That's, that's the premise of the article. And believe it or not, I've never had one, I've never owned one, but I had to learn what to do to get, get some use out of it. But, you know, the wide bevel just makes it real easy to keep that bevel flat on the stone. And there's, there's, no, there's no wobble, there's no anything. And, I have a question. Yes, sir. When you originally flat, 
What grit do you go up to for your flattening? Do you want the mirror finish on the back side too? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yep. So anyway, Japanese tools are, are really easy to sharpen by hand. So let's take this guy. Um, I don't know how sharp I'm going to be able to get it. I'm going to have to cheat a little bit. Um, when I sharpen by hand, Can you guys see this all right? I put the bevel down on the stone and I rock it back and forth until I either see it or feel that tip contact the stone, the cutting edge contact the stone. Sometimes you can feel it kind of click in there. If your stone is wet, which it should be, always keep your stones wet if you're using water stones, you can see the water move out from under the cutting edge as that, as that cutting edge goes down. So this is how I hold a chisel. I've got my two fingers that right down on that bevel because I want to keep that bevel flat on the stone. And I'm just using these three fingers back here to help support the blade. And I'm just going to go back and forth like this. That's the way I feel comfortable doing it. Now, there, you know, guys will try to do this. The, prob the problem with that is as you go out, you tend to lift. As you come back, you tend to drop. Now you've got a rounded edge, and I suspect that might be what happened to this one because it was kind of rounded a little bit. If you're not careful doing it the way you do it, you'll end up with the bottom or the skew. So. Well... <laughs> You know, that's, that's a good point, and that's, that's why you have a small engineer's square always on hand. Make sure that your edge is nice and square. If it starts going out, then you know you need to compensate by putting more pressure on that high edge. It's not rocket science, guys, and what's the worst that can happen? You screw it up, you'll have to go back and try again. So that's how I, I hold a chisel, and I've already got eh, pretty close to the cutting edge there. So then I would progress through the grits um, until that cutting edge is polished. I don't necessarily have to have the whole bevel polished, but at least a 64th or 32nd of an inch back from the cutting edge, I should be able to reflect light. Okay? So. You have done with that through the, you said 6,000 or something? Do you use a leather strop to hold uh, it? Yep, uh, good question. This guy, I think I've sharpened already. Here's one of my tests for sharpness, if it grabs my thumbnail. If it slips, then it's not sharp, because the edge is rounded, right? But if it, if it grabs my thumbnail and doesn't move, I can pretty much guarantee it's sharp. Another test I use is take a piece of, uh, you guys can't see that. I've got a piece of basswood here. You could use pine or some softwood. What happens when a cutting edge that's not sharp hits the end grain of softwood? Or it crushes it. Doesn't even cut. So I use a piece of softwood. Here I've got basswood because I dabble in carving sometimes. And I just check to see, you know, can I take, you know, whisper thin shavings off of that without any effort and this one seems to be doing pretty well I got a nice I got a nice clean edge there's I don't feel any resistance where it's not cutting so I, I'm pretty confident I could go take this back to work and, and cut some joinery with it strops Again, talk to 100 woodworkers, get 100 different answers on whether to use strops or not. I tend to like them because for me, it puts that final polish on the edge and sometimes the strop's all you need to bring an edge back as you're using it. So I, I went to uh, 
when I lived in Des Moines, Tandy Leather Company had a retail store. I went and bought some scrap leather, used some wood glue and, and fastened it to a half inch piece of Baltic birch. Uh, I used the shiny or the smooth side, not the suede side. Uh, guys use both. I, I don't know, I just always use the smooth side of the letter. Uh, I got some honing compound. From, this one's from Veritas again, but Rockler sells it, Woodcraft sells it. Just load it up a little bit. Jewelers Rouge. Jewelers Rouge works. And so you've gone through all your water stones and uh, I skipped a step there. So as you sharpen the bevel, well, you can get a burr that forms on the back side. Sometimes you can feel it, sometimes you can see it, but you can guarantee it's there because you're, you're removing metal and those, what's, what's being removed is kind of curling up along that sharp edge. So if you see a burr, what some people call it a wire edge, that's a good thing. That means you're pretty close to sharp. So as you're sharpening, uh, when I get to my last stone, I'll take my blade, back down flat, one stroke back away from the cutting edge, should take that burr off. Stropping. How many of you are familiar with Paul Sellers? He's one of my, he's one of my idols for hand tool woodworking. Uh, so go online and look up Paul Sellers. He's got a ton of YouTube videos. He's a big proponent of uh, using a leather strop. So when he's done uh, with the stones, he'll go to his leather strop, you know, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Now here, I can't push because I'm going to cut my leather and I've done that. You should see my old strop. It's torn to pieces. Uh, so, you know, tap a dozen or so strokes on the bevel and then remove the burr, one stroke back. That thing should be razor sharp. So how do you know when a tool needs honed? My definition of honing versus sharpening, sharpening is getting to an edge, honing is refining the edge. That's, that's my definition. I don't know if it's technically accurate, but when I say honing, I just mean touching up the edge. You don't have to go through all the stones again. So how do you know when it's time to touch up the edge again? Your thumbnail touch, right? That's one way. It's not dull. It's not cutting I mean, smooth. You can usually feel it's dull and finish. As you, once you understand how a sharp tool acts, and goes into the wood, it's one of those aha moments. It's like, oh my gosh. I was working on a project with one of my kids. I've got seven boys. Uh, I was working on a project and, and I forget what it was we were doing, but I pulled out a chisel and I was just paring off just the smallest little shavings and he goes, that's sharp. So once you, and, and the same thing with my students at the school, you know, once they figure out what sharp is, it's, it's eye-opening to them. Now you've got a tool that you can do something with. All right, so as you're using a tool and you, you start noticing that you're not getting as clean a shaving as you thought you should be, or it's taking more effort, It doesn't hurt to go back to your strop. Hit your strop again, remove the burr, and go back at it. Sometimes you need to go back to your stone, maybe just the, the highest stone that you were using, touch it up, then strop, then go check it, test it. 